My life before, you know, I don't remember my life before God. I just know that I grew away from God and turned away from God and, and alcohol and uh, became, uh, over many years, it became the driving force in my life. When Elaine and I married, I mean, I didn't, it wasn't, didn't appear to be much of a, of a real problem. Uh, of course, she and I didn't grow up around alcoholism or alcoholics, so we really didn't know what the warning signs were. Uh, alcoholism and addiction is a progressive thing. It just gets worse. It never gets better. As long as you keep feeding that monster, it's just going to get bigger. Uh, Elaine always knew there was a problem, and she did everything in her power to to get me to stop, but uh, as an alcoholic, I had to come to that point on my own. She couldn't love me into it. She couldn't threaten me or uh, she, there was nothing she could do. Uh, so my life before God's intervention was a very lonely, at the end was a very lonely, um, isolated situation where I was basically holed up in an apartment drinking extreme amounts of alcohol on, on a daily basis. When it got down to the, the very bitter end, I mean, at times I was suicidal. Uh, one minute I wanted to die and the next minute I, my, my soul would cry out to live and mercifully that, that voice went out. I can't even begin to describe the loneliness and the pain that you feel when you get to that point. We're going to have the honor and privilege of sharing the rest of Lance's testimony this week with you through the weekly word. But our God is a way maker, and he reaches down into the depths. I remember just a, a couple weeks ago when uh, we had the baptisms through Grace House, and at the conclusion of that service, one of the fathers from the daughter who was baptized who was a previous addict, came up with tears streaming down his face, and he threw his arms around me, and he just began to weep and say, thank you. Thank you for giving me my daughter back. You see, alcohol is a depressant, depressing the highest centers of the brain where self-control, wisdom, and judgment lie. To get drunk is to lose control and escape reality. Wine is a mocker, strong drink a brawler, and whoever is led astray by it is not wise. As we will see in today's passage, it is never God's will for Christians to get drunk. But instead, we are to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Turn with me in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 5. 15 through 21, we're going to continue our walk through the book of Ephesians. I'm going to give you a warning. There is a lot to cover today. I need you to roll up your sleeves, and I need you to get ready, okay? And I need you to put your big boy pants on, because we're going to, we're going to hit it running. And I'm not going to give you a trite, just kind of superficial answer where we just kind of gloss over issues, but rather the scripture is going to hit us with full force. And we'll circle back around all the way at the end, okay? Ephesians 5, 15 through 21. Listen as I read. <laughs> Therefore, be careful how you walk. Not as unwise men, but as wise, making the most of your time because the days are evil. So then do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody with your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks for all things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to God, even to the Father, and be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. Will you pray with me? Our Heavenly Father, we just need to pause and confess to you this morning about how often we are filled with superficial things. 
and we allow temporary trinkets to captivate our mind and our heart, and we don't wait for you. Our heart doesn't crave you because you are better. Would you stir that up this morning? The king who left his throne for a cradle in the dirt, would you stir up our affections for you? The one who is the way maker, the one who is not only able, but is more than willing to fill our lives and our hearts with the greatest of gifts, ultimately your presence, would you stir up our affections for you this morning? We love you. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. For the past 10 years, Snickers has had kind of a clever ad campaign that goes like this. You are not yourself when you're hungry. Featuring many funny moments where people are being very overly dramatic and the root cause is because they're hungry. Now, one of my favorite of those is four guys are on a road trip, right? It's a guy's road trip, but suddenly you realize Aretha Franklin is in the back seat and she is high maintenance, all right? The, the, it's too hot in here, it's too stuffy, and, and there's all sorts of complaining to which his buddy turns to him and says, Jeff, eat a Snickers. You become a diva when you're hungry. And then as the commercials go, he takes a bite and then is back to his normal self. You see, their point is that the real problem is hunger. And if you solve that, then all the other problems regain perspective. We do this as parents whenever uh, it's late and it's about an hour past bedtime and we're in all out meltdown mode. And we tap each other on the shoulder and say, honey, be patient, she is overly tired. To borrow from D.A. Carson, I need you to think with me for a moment. What is humanity's greatest problem? The primary, the problem of the first degree that God must solve. And if he solves that, every other issue regains perspective. If it's politics and the structure of government, then we would pray, God, give us revolutionary politicians. Give us the Bill of Rights and the balance of powers. If it's social programs and education for the poor, then God, give us teachers and farmers and help us to increase the economy and help us to bring up the lower class. If our greatest need is illness and to lengthen our days, then God, give us great doctors and scientists to cure cancer and heart disease. But if our greatest need is sin and being separated from God himself, then God, give us your son. And may he ransom us from our sin. And may he exchange our hearts of stones for hearts that beat for him. And may he leave his Holy Spirit to indwell in us that we might be filled with joy and laughter and strength and the ability to walk with him and have restored fellowship with him. You see, before we jump into our passage, it needs to be framed for us. Because as good as all those other things that I listed are, only one truth brings all things into proper perspective. That our greatest need is knowing and desiring God with our whole heart and overcoming our selfishness of sin in chasing every other thing besides him. 
Therefore, be careful how you walk, not as unwise men, but as wise, making the most of your time because the days are evil. So then do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is and do not get drunk with wine for that is dissipation, but be filled with the spirit. Now, this is the fifth time in chapters four and five that Paul has instructed us on our walk. Walk worthy, walk in holiness, walk in love, walk as children of light. And here, be careful how you walk. Now, in this section of 15 through 18, he has a pattern that he's going to repeat three times where he says, not, but do this. Look with me in verse 15. He says, walk not as unwise, but as wise. Verse 17, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. In verse 18, do not get drunk, but be filled with with the Spirit. You see, it all works together as a unit. And Paul begins to warn us, pay careful attention, close attention to how you walk. Your life requires an alertness, a precision, every step that you take. Why? Because the days are evil. There are many pitfalls and life is short. Do not be like the unwise fool who is short-sighted and cannot see the evilness of the day. The fool lives for the temporary. He selfishly wants comfort and instant gratification only to appease himself in the moment. But we are not the unwise fool. Guys, we are wise. Paul is pulling forward ideas that he has previously established earlier in the letter. Way back in chapter 1, verses 8 and 9, when we were walking through every spiritual blessing that we have in Christ Jesus, he, he explained to us what God's wisdom is, that he has revealed to us the wisdom of God. He has given us a spirit of wisdom. And that is the unfolding plan that all things will be summed up in Christ Jesus. That he is the creator. He is the sustainer. He is the king of kings. And one day, everything will be laid at his feet. And you and I see that. And it's why Paul immediately at the end of chapter one, he erupts in prayer. And he says, oh, I pray you got to know that you would have a, a, a spirit of wisdom and that your hearts would be enlightened, that you would see, this is Paul's prayer at the end of one, that you would see the wisdom that all things are moving towards Christ and that you would understand what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of his inheritance and what is his power towards us. You see, being wise means you have the ability to see things from God's perspective. Verse 16, he says, make most of the time. That literally means by the time. By the time, because time is short and your one life is but a fleeting breath. Opportunities in life are fleeting. And it is so easy to spend your life on Pokemon cards. Yeah, I don't know what that is. Well, as a parent, each of my kids went through a Pokemon card phase. That is, they would save up their money and they would run to Walmart or whoever sold it, and they would drop down 20 to $40 buying Pokemon packs. These cards that have uh, uh, these number systems on it, and they would get their binders, they would put all their cards in a binder, and then they would go all through the neighborhood, and they would trade Pokemon cards. And the whole time, and they're just looking at numbers and what they like about the card, and they're trading Pokemon cards. They are spending hours of this. 
and they don't even know how to play the game. I am dumbfounded by this. They never play the game. They go, they buy these two cent cards. I mean, they can't be, I mean, you can print 500 for a nickel. And all they have is a, a little number value on them. And these kids don't even know how to play the game. And they package them up and they go around their neighborhood and they just trade them and trade them and trade them. And they try and get more value. And the whole time you're like, it only has value because you give it value. Oh, how often does God look at what we give value to and just scream, why? Why do you give such value to fleeting pleasures? Buy the time. Because the days slip into decay. And every second, two souls enter into eternity to face their creator. Pastor, I don't see how going to work, providing for my family, want to, wanting to enjoy uh, vacations and a few comforts in life, like a nice house, uh, maybe a boat. How is that evil? Listen to me. The Bible does not chastise you for having blessings, or enjoying life. The Bible chastises you for being filled by the world and not by God himself. Remember with me in Luke chapter 12 where Jesus was pressing this very issue as he's interacting. He knows how tempted we are as, as humans to be uh, to just chase after possessions after possessions. And Jesus in Luke 12 tells a parable where he says there was a rich man whose, whose land was abundant and he had so much crops he filled up all of his barns. And after his barns were full, he said to himself, well, what do I do next? And so he says, I'll tear down all my barns and I'll build bigger ones. And here's the rich man saying, and I will say to my soul, soul, you have many goods laid up uh, for many years to come. Take your ease, eat and drink and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your soul is required of you. And now who will, go, and now who will own what you have prepared? So is the man who stores up for himself sorry, stores up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. You hear it? Do not fill up in that which doesn't last. You fool, be rich in God. God should be your treasure. And again, later in that chapter, Jesus uh, it furthers the point and he, he talks about a wicked servant who lived as if the master was never going to return. And so he, he didn't do his chores. He didn't treat the other servants well. Instead, he just sat around and ate and got drunk and had his fill, only to be horrified when the master returned. You see, the days are evil because our world is filled with fools who live for all that's fleeting and have no fear or delight in God. O oh, sons of men, how long will you love what is worthless? But we are not like that. We have arisen from the dead, and he has given us eyes to see, to see God. And to see the summation that all things are from him and through him and will be laid at his feet. And he's given us a new heart and a desire to walk worthy of him. And so we heed his instruction and do not get drunk with wine for that is dissipation. But be continually filled with the Holy Spirit. You see, at this point, you can see why Paul picked getting drunk as the perfect picture 
of the world running and chasing towards escapes and everything that is fleeting. But we don't run back to our old nature. Instead, we are charged to be continually filled with the Holy Spirit. The moment that you were saved, you were gifted the permanent indwelling Holy Spirit. I still remember when I got saved at the age of 15. There are a lot of kind of funny things about that. You you, you know, you ask Jesus to be your savior and, and, and then someone tapped me on the shoulder and said, all right, now you have the spirit. How does it feel? I don't know exactly how this is supposed to feel. What I can tell you, how I genuinely knew that the spirit was inside of me was over the course of the next couple weeks, there was, there was this peace, this calmness, this assurance that was there. Now, here's the deal. Your experience of the Holy Spirit is as different as there are personalities in here. It is not the same for everyone. And our assurance, our grounding is not on any emotional experience. It's on the word of God. Romans 8, 9 says with absolute clarity that if you are of Christ, you have the Holy Spirit. The deposit of your salvation, that you have been sealed with him, a permanent fixed reality. But the Bible also speaks about the need to be continually filled with the Spirit. Those in Acts 2 who at Pentecost received the Holy Spirit were the very same ones in Acts chapter 4 who in the midst of persecution and fear hit their knees and began to pray. And in Acts 4, all were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak the word of God with boldness. You see, in this sense, no one stays filled with the Holy Spirit. You have a leaky bucket that needs continual refilling. And that's why he compares it to indulging on drink. Because every day you will wake up and just like eating, your heart will feast on something. It will feast on something. It cannot. And your choices are polarizing. You will either be filled with the futility of the world or God's Holy Spirit. Now, I need to circle back around to this landing spot because this is where I want to land at the end, and this is the flavor that I want you to leave with, but I want you to also see how the rest of this passage works out because verses 18 through 21 are actually one long sentence in the Greek. There is one imperative. That imperative, that command is be filled with the Spirit. Now, the rest of what comes after that, five participles, are all describing what it looks like to be filled with the Spirit. So hear me clearly. 19 through 21 describe the overflow of the Spirit of God. Not the how, simply the effects. So the first evidence of being filled with the Spirit of God. Look at verse 19. Speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody with your heart to the Lord. Isn't this an amazing statement about the culture and flavor of when the Holy Spirit resides inside of you, the way that your heart automatically expands Explodes and overflows in joyful song. You see, the world gets intoxicated and overflows with fleeting, slurred songs, rejoicing in an escaping reality just for a moment. Whereas we, our senses aren't dulled. 
We're not escaping reality. Rather, we're pressing into the reality of God's promises. We see clearly, we see what God is doing, we see who he is and all that he has promised us, and we overflow in joyful song. When peace, like a river, attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, Whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. My sin, oh, the bliss of this glorious thought. My sin, not in part, but the whole, was nailed to the cross, and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, oh, my soul. Will you sing this final Stands it with me? And Lord, haste the day when my face shall be sad. The clouds be rolled back as a scroll. The trumps shall resound, and the Lord shall descend, even so it is well with my soul. You see, there is joy unmistakable when we sing the promises of God. You know that's what singing is, right? It is Christians holding on to the word of God and the promises of God and singing them and leading their faith. And it is the overflow. If you are filled with the spirit, you will erupt in joy and in song. Secondly, the evidence of being filled with the spirit Verse 20 says, giving thanks for all things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. As we've walked through the book of Ephesians, we've seen repeatedly this refrain of thanksgiving, right? Do not run back to your old nature, but rather lead your heart in thankfulness because God causes all things to work together for the good of those who love him. A video I saw several years ago, I automatically think of when I hear the word thankfulness. I want you to watch this video of Christians in China receiving Bibles that they hadn't had in their language. Watch this. Thankfulness. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, the sons and daughters of God are filled with thankfulness for all that God has provided. The third evidence that Paul gives for being filled with the Spirit is actually what's going to be the catalyst for the entire next section as as the letter moves forward for our relationships at home and work. Now, catch this. Evidence for the Spirit, be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. The Spirit of God is not brash or prideful. He is humble and meek. And one of the clearest signs that you are not filled with the spirit of of God is the inability to submit to authority that God has placed in your life. 
Instead, we are called to be like Christ, who girded himself with a towel and became a servant and washed his disciples' feet. And in at the conclusion, looked at his disciples and said, you do likewise. Are you greater than the master? Be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. So now let's recap. I want you to see the overall flow of this passage. He begins with a three-part do not but do, right? Uh, Do not be unwise. Do not be a fool. Do not get drunk. That is to fill up on the temporary nature of the world. But rather, the command, be filled, continually filled with the Spirit of God. And then he gives three evidences for being filled. And those evidences are that we overflow with joy and song in our lives, that we are thankful and that we submit to authority that God has placed in our lives. Now, I know I've said a lot this morning. I wanted you to have that structure because I wanted to be able to camp out on this final section so that we genuinely understand and place it together and put it in our lives. And I saved a nugget for the end, okay, just for you. At this point, you could ask the question, Or you could make the statement, Pastor, I know how to get drunk. I know how to feast on the things of this world. That's easy, right? You just indulge. You just do whatever you want to do. There's this physical, tangible, you just do it. But how am I filled with the Spirit of God? Now, what's amazing about this passage is the preciseness, the clarity that the Greek provides. So number one, you have to understand it's a command. It's an imperative. It is not a suggestion. We are charged to use our human will and responsibility to be filled by the Spirit, okay? Second, as I've told you, it's continual, We must be continually refilled. But thirdly, this command is in the passive voice. It's a passive command, meaning God is the one who does the filling. The Holy Spirit is the one who does the filling. You can't manufacture it. So how am I commanded to be filled and I'm not the filler? This passage speaks with abundant clarity about this first truth, and that is that God cannot fill you. He cannot fill you if you are already clenched on to that which is fleeting and that which the world always holds on to. If you are already full, you can't be filled. You hear me? That's the overwhelming flow and thrust to this passage. And how often do we need to hit our knees and repent of that? God, I I am filled so often by that which does not matter. So God cannot fill you if your hand is already closed, if it's already clenched. You say, okay, But now that I've let go, and I'm not holding on to any other thing, how can I be filled? Ready? Believe and wait. As I was studying and working towards this this week, John Piper pointed me to this verse and thinking through it. Listen to Romans 15, 13. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in or by believing 
so that you will abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Notice that it is in or by believing that we are filled with joy and peace, which the Spirit produces. Okay? It is in believing. Listen to this, Hebrews eleven six. 6, and without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. So let's, let's piece this together. Oh, how often we cling to that which is unworthy. But rather, when we are not of the world because we see as all that God is doing and we no longer hold on to just any life raft that comes along. But rather, as we sit here and we are, all right, God, you believe that God wants to fill you Because you see God, you see who he is, you see his nature, and you see all that he is doing. He left heaven to get into the dirt, to be born in a manger, and to die on a cross for you. Do you think he wants to fill you? And so you sit here, and you say, you know what? I believe, I see your character, I see your son, and you will wait for him. I will wait for you, my God, because I have tasted and I have seen that you are good, and I will not be satisfied with temporary little substitutes that always distract me, but I will wait for you because I believe that you are good, and I believe that that in your right hand you hold, uh, you can satisfy the desire of every living thing. I want you, and so I will wait for you. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Will you pray with me? Our Heavenly Father, right now, in our seats, sir, At home, wherever we're listening, we kneel in our hearts and we sit with our hands open out, begging you to fill us. Fill us, Holy Spirit. Allow us to taste and see your goodness. We repent, we confess how often we hold on to that which is so fleeting. Forgive us, Father. Forgive us, for we have loved that which is worthless, that which does not compare to you. We want to be filled with you. We know we are weak. We know we are so short-sighted, but give us your eyes. Teach us. Renew us. Strengthen us. Help us to walk with you, to walk worthy of you. In this evil day, fill us. Fill us with your Holy Spirit. If we do not have your presence, God, who are we? What do we have? We just play church if it is not for you, if it is not for your word, if your fire does not come down, if you do not fill us, what do we have? It's all meaningless. We need you. In a dry and weary land, we need you. In a broken culture where there is so much hurt, where there is so much discord and divisiveness, God, we need you. And how often we are so satisfied with trivial things, God. Help us. Help the church, the ones that you have filled with your spirit, the ones that you have called the living temple. Help us to feast on you and only you. We repent. We repent right now in Jesus' name and we turn. 
We turn from our materialism. We, re- we turn from things that do not satisfy God. Help them to be rooted out of our hearts and our lives and our minds so that we could feast on you. Help us. Help us to use our resources in ways that honor you. Help us to realize how we can use th- those things that are good, but not to get ensnared by them. Please help us, Father. We need you, Holy Spirit. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.